Okay. 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 Fundamental theorem of calculus. There are actually two parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to do the easier one today and the more important one today. We'll save the uh, second fundamental theorem of calculus for Friday. As I've said many times, if a theorem has its own name, it's important. This has its own name. It's really important. So you should be able to uh, understand the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to use it to calculate definite integrals. That'll be fun. Uh, we got some mean value theorem for integrals. We had a mean value theorem for derivatives already, which said... <coughs> what's the buzz phrase for the mean value theorem? Oh, <laughs> slope from calculus equals a slope from algebra. We'll talk about the average value function. That ties in with the mean value theorem. That's Friday stuff. And uh, as I mentioned on Friday, we'll do the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And then your goal for today is to meet somebody new in a non-creepy way. <laughs> OK, so here we go. Fundamental theorem of calculus. What the fundamental theorem of calculus is going to allow us to do is to find the value of definite integrals for things that don't make pretty geometric pictures. So everything we've done over the last couple of days has been Oh, look, I've got this graph where that's a rectangle, that's a triangle, that's a semicircle, or I shift it up and I throw some more rectangles in there. This is going to allow us to find the value of the definite integral of any function, regardless of how complicated or nasty it looks. And it's this. So I'll give you a chance to write that down, then I'll put it in English for you. It's actually a fairly easy process. The left half of that equal sign is what you already know. That's just the way to write the definite integral, also known as the area under the curve. The right-hand side of that equal sign tells you how to do it. If lowercase f of x is the function, what is uppercase f? The antiderivative, correct. So all this says to do, and yes, it's just this simple. There's no catches to it. Take the antiderivative of the function, plug in the upper limit of integration, plug in the lower limit of integration, subtract the two. Easy peasy. Okay. So for the most part, the rest of our lesson today, then it's just practice up this. Up this, on this, with this, near this, up this. about it, this, whatever. This is so important that I'm making it change colors. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing what happens when you can work PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, first example. We'll start with something simple. Before you start grinding out the answer, though, let's think about this logically. Should my answer be positive or negative? Why? Alex? What's positive? That is the derivative is positive. We have no derivative up there. There's a thing. It's the integral. The integrals are neither positive nor negative. The function. The one I was on the board is positive. No. Well, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Why is it positive? Because it's above the. What's it? Zero to three. The function. Good. That's all I was looking for. The function on the integral from zero on the interval from zero to three is above the x-axis because it's a cubic function, and therefore when you find the area between the function and the x-axis, you'll get a positive area. So when you're done with the work, your answer should be positive. Now this of course requires that you remember how to take an antiderivative because it's been a number of days. Obviously, many of you don't because you're just sitting there like bumps on a log. Got it. Bumps on a log. Oh, it's ants on a log. Yeah. Is that celery with peanut butter and rice? Yeah. That's another good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Bumps on a pickle? Yeah, I mean, it's like it's nicer than bumps on a log. That's your bump on it. Thank you. 
Oh, correct. Okay. Remember, this is a definite integral, so you should get a numerical value. Just like that. There you go. No plus C. Definite integral. Good. Good. This is not a differential equation. Because it's a definite integral. Pluses are only for indefinite integrals. Good. Okay. Okay. You're not right. Because you just didn't get an answer. That is what's actually on the left hand side. Okay. 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 Eighty-one fourths, yeah. also known as twenty point two five. Here's how it goes. Okay, so some new notation. Here's what I'm starting with. I took the antiderivative and got x, or you probably have one fourth x to the fourth, but x to the fourth over four is the same thing. Then you draw a bracket. Okay. And to be honest, I get lazy and I don't draw the whole bracket. I just, I use a segment. What this notation means is I've taken the antiderivative, but I haven't plugged in the limits of integration yet. So according to fundamental theorem of calculus, I plug in three first. Got it right here. I plug in zero, I subtract the two. Well, the zero in this case doesn't matter, so it just goes away. That process is all you do over and over again. It's fairly repetitive and fairly simple. Take the antiderivative, plug in B, plug in A, subtract the two values. Okay, we good? Ready for another? Yes, sir? So when you find an antiderivative, you should write it like that before you take the definite. Correct. This shows I took the antiderivative to get this, then I plug in the numbers to get my numerical value. Okay. Okay, try that one. Will my answer be positive or negative? Why? So? So it has to be Because? Figured if you said it with enough authority. Function. That function. I don't know why. That's why. Okay. okay. It's
good? Almost. Should get 14, yes? Okay, so let's go through this again. Uh, the three doesn't matter, so I started by moving the three out in front. That's probably a habit you want to get into, but you probably didn't do that because when you raise the power to one to get three halves, when you multiplied the two thirds times the three, it reduced to two. So there's my antiderivative with the bracket showing the limits of integration. Plug in four. By the way, how do you do four to the three halves without a calculator? Well, it's four cubed and the square root. Do you know what four cubed is? 64. The square root of 64 is 8. You could also do it the other way. You could take the square root of 4 to get 2, then raise it to the third power. Either one, you get your answer, and then multiply it by 2. So take that value then, subtract that value, and you end up with an answer of 14, which is good because we thought it should be positive because it's all above the x-axis. Okay, not so bad, right? What's coming next? Trig. There you go. That's pi over four. No plus c. What do you got? One. One. If you didn't hear me before, yes, you need to know all six of the trig antiderivatives. Or if you know the trig derivatives, you can go backward. I don't care how you do it. You got to know those six. You can use a bracket or a line. You Reggie, you have a question? Oh, yeah. Okay, last one. 
Now, this one you're probably not going to get, so I'm not going to give you 20 minutes to work it out. But we have to be a little creepy, or creepy? Creepy. Or I don't know where that came from. <laughs> creative is what I meant to say. I don't know. I went from creative to creepy. Okay, I'm just going to stand in the corner for a second. Um, just like derivatives, when we're doing derivatives, we try to avoid taking the derivative of the, of the absolute value as much as possible. The same is true with antiderivatives. I don't want to take the antiderivative of the absolute value. So I have to come up with a different way to do it. And it would help this problem. Well, first of all, before I show you the picture, you tell me, what does the absolute value do to the function? Good. You all said it, so we'll just move on. That's a parabola. The absolute value flips the stuff below the y, uh, x-axis over, and we get a graph that looks like that. And I'm looking for the antiderivative, or I should say the definite integral, from negative 2 to 3. So I want to find from here to here. So that doesn't matter. We're going to ignore that. How do I go about doing this? Well, notice from negative 2 to negative 1, nothing changes. That's just what part of the parabola would be there regardless of whether it was absolute value or not. So to go from, uh, from negative 2 to negative 1, I could just do this. Negative 2 to negative 1 of x squared minus 2x minus 3 dx. Are you with me? How do I handle the other stuff? How do I handle the region from negative 1 to 3? Here. Can you put a negative? Beautiful. I'm just going to put a negative sign in front of it. I'm going to find the area under the curve, which the answer would be negative, and multiply my answer by negative 1. And I can do that a couple different ways. Instead of doing plus here, like I'm adding the two regions, I could just put a minus there. Or I could do it the way that I did it in my notes, which would be the following. Distribute that minus sign. So here's the stuff that didn't change on the left because that's just that area from there to there. And then on the right, I took the same function, but I changed the sign of everything. In other words, I multiplied everything by negative 1. Wait. We will, yeah, Mitch. How do we know uh, like what area of flips? Excellent. How graph? Excellent. How do I know where those points are? Critical numbers, yeah. I set the function inside the absolute value bars equal to zero and solve for critical numbers. So that's something that we like have to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. We'll come back to this in a second in order to solve this. I'm going to show you a different way to solve it other than grinding it out. So we're not going to finish this problem because we've got to talk about a couple other things. But again, we'll come back to this in a second. Okay, you with me on the concept though? Take everything below. Find the integral, just multiply the answer by a negative so that you have a positive area there. Okay, so a couple quick notes. Uh, one of the things you'll hear me say over and over and over again is that the, the integral acts as an accumulator. We're adding area together. So when we talk about going from negative 1 or negative 2 to, let's say, 3, what I'm doing actually is adding all these little bitty areas together. So it's accumulating these areas as we move from left to right. And you put enough of those together and you end up getting the area. So that's the first thing to consider. Aside from the integral being the area under the curve, it's also accumulating area as you move from left to right. And the key too is that we want to always be moving from left to right. If it's going from right to left, we need to change that. That's the first concept. The next concept is uh, a little bit of physics. Do you understand the difference between displacement and total distance? Does anybody not and or need a clarification? OK. I start here. You with me? Yeah. I walk up here. I cha-cha backwards. Oh, I yeah. walk up here, and then I cha-cha backwards. That's not really a cha-cha. Yeah. What's my displacement? Zero. What's my total distance? Whatever, Whatever that. Okay. <laughs> what we don't want to do in math then is have to calculate all those distances and then add them up. Nor do I want to have to calculate 
from starting to ending for the displacement. So we cheat and use a formula. There are two different formulas. If you take the antiderivative of the velocity without absolute values, it'll tell you your displacement. The distance from where you started to where you ended. It doesn't matter what happened in between. If you put absolute value around it, it gives you the total distance that you covered. Make sense? Okay. This is something you're going to forget about, and it's going to come up in that problem. You're going to make, oh, yeah, absolute value. Frank. Right. No, that's if they give you the velocity of an object. Oh. Okay. And we'll do some problems, which uh, it's called um, rectilinear motion, where objects move along a line, like a spring, for instance. Um, and we'll be calculating total distance. Okay, that comes later. Okay. Then the last thing you're going to like, uh, if you don't already have it out, get out your calculators. On your calculator, hit Math 9. Some of you are going to see this, Fn int. How many of your calculators display this? Raise your hand. Okay. And the rest of you are going to see the integral symbol, correct? Yes. All right. Uh, for those of you that have Fn int, I'll get back to you in a second. For those of you that have the integral symbol, yes, your calculator will calculate definite integrals for you. Okay. So test it. Go back to the first problem that we did from 0 to 3 of x cubed. Plug that into the calculator and check to make sure you get 20.25 as an answer. 0 to 3, x cubed, and then don't forget you've got to put an x after the d in that formula. You've got to tell what the variable is. Okay. Good. On the calculator portion of the AP test, they know that you have that function on your calculator. They're expecting you to use it as much as possible. Any time you're asked to take a definite integral on the calculator portion of the AP test, you should never, ever, ever do it by hand. Have the calculator do it. If you want an exact answer, then do math, enter, enter. It'll put it back into fraction form if you can. It'll display it as 81 fourths. However, initially when we start this, you can't go gung-ho with your calculator. You will see in some of our directions, it'll say, find the antiderivative. If it says find the antiderivative, then you do have to go through the manual process of finding that value and then plugging numbers in because we want to make sure that you can do it. On the homework then, you don't want to go calculator crazy and solve every problem using your calculator because you'll never, never learn the other process. Okay. Now, for those of you that have the FN int, there are two ways that you can handle this. The first way is I can update your calculator and put the new operating system on it. It takes about 10 minutes per calculator, so it's not something we can all do today. But over time, like for instance tomorrow during the quiz, if you don't need your calculator for a little bit, I can update it. I also want to put some programs on there that we're going to be using in the future. Or you can learn the notation. If you want to learn the notation, it's fairly simple. It just means f of x is the function, so you would put in x cubed. x is always going to be x. You literally put the letter x in there. And then a is the lower limit and b is the upper limit. So if you were doing that function we just finished, you would type it in as fn int would come up. You would type in x cubed comma x comma zero comma three. Where's the comma you say? You probably never noticed, but there's an entire key dedicated to the comma. It's above seven. Hit enter and it'll give you 20.25. I would suggest tonight and tomorrow night when you're working on these problems and getting familiar with finding definite integrals that you use the calculator for checks and balances. Grind out the antiderivative, put in the values that you need, get an answer, and then plug it into the calculator to see if you did it correctly. The most common mistake that people make when they start antiderivative problems are not taking antiderivatives. It's actually something as simple as a minus sign. You do plus instead of minus, or you take a minus a negative and leave it as minus. That's what kills most people, not the actual calculus involved. Okay. Questions? Tomorrow's the quiz. That'll take, uh, I'm going to give you the whole period. Most of you won't need the whole period, but I'm going to give it to you. You will have another assignment tomorrow. So on Friday, 
there will be day uh, 60 and 61 due. And we'll go over those definite integrals to make sure you're understanding this process before we get into all the theory that goes along with this stuff. Okay? We good? Awesome.